First of all, I want you to know that I come from Route 4, Liberty, Mississippi. Now, that's 12 miles west of Macomb, Mississippi, 65 miles due northeast of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and 116 miles due north of New Orleans, Louisiana. It was there that I first saw the light of day out at Amit County, September the 28th, 1926. I was born there. Now, as I grew up in that community, the only extracurricular activities that we engaged in was to go coon hunting or go to revival meeting if we had a crop laid by. And that's all we did except work. And this particular day that I want to tell you about is one evening when we were going coon hunting. We had a pack of hounds. When we went to mill with our corn to get it ground up, we'd get some ground for dog bread and we'd get some ground for just regular corn meal for human consumption. This particular day, we wasn't too busy. All we had done is just cut down a few fence rows, shut and shelled some corn and went to mill, drew up some water because that was wash day, helped get the sow back, what rooted out from under the net wire fence, sharpened two sticks of stove wood real sharp and pegged them down over the bottom wire of the fence where the hog couldn't root out no more. And had a rat killing. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Uh, we had rat killings in those days. Well, this particular day after we got through the rat killing, I walked out on the front porch and I hollered, hey! and them dogs come out from the house barking. They knew we was going coon hunting. And I hollered again, and my neighbor way across the sage patch hollered back, and that meant I'll meet you halfway. We met in the middle of that sage patch, and he had his dogs, old Brummy and Queen and Spot, and I had Tory and Little Red and old Trailer. And we went out into the swamps, and we started hunting. Oh, we was having such a fine time. Caught four great big ones. I heard a racket, and it scared me, and I whooped my carbide light, what I had wired to my cap around there, and I was looking in the vicinity of where I heard the racket coming from. And the beam of light hit a man right in the face, and it lacked him to have scared me slapped to death because we was hunting on this man's place. <laughs> I said, Mr. Barron, is that you? He said, yes, Jerry. What are y'all doing? We hunting. How many have you caught? Four great big ones. He said, well, boys, uh, glad to see you. Y'all want to spend the rest of the evening hunting with me and John. Well, I looked, and lo and behold, there was John Eubanks, a man that lived on Mr. Barron's place. John Newbanks was a great American. He was a professional tree climber. He didn't believe, uh, I'm, I'm telling you the truth, he didn't believe in shooting no coon out of no tree. It was against his upbringing. He taught us from birth, from the day we were born till the age we could keep listening to him. Give everything a sporting chance. Whatever you do, give it a sporting chance. He'd have been a great conservationist today if, he, if he'd be here. And John said, take a cross-cut saw, coon hunting with you. When you tree a coon, hold the dogs and cut the tree down. Or either climb the tree and make the coon jump in amongst the dogs. Give him a sporting chance. A lot of times we climb a tree and make a coon jump in amongst 20 dogs but at least he had the option of whooping all them dogs and walking off if he wanted to. <laughs> this is strictly left up to the coon. <laughs> so I said, Mr. Barron, we'd be glad to go hunting with you. You know, he was a rich man. He, he, he had sold a lot of cotton during the First World War for a dollar a pound. He had some world-renowned dogs. And we hollered three or four times, and they started hunting. And we listened, and directly, Old Brummy, old Brummy didn't bark at nothing but a coon. He had a deep voice. And when he cut out on him, it was a coon. Don't worry about no possum or no bobcat. Brummy was running a coon. And then old trailer and old highball and them famous dogs and Mr. Barron's got in there with them and old John Eubanks would holler, hey, speak to him. And my brother's son would holler, hey, look for And oh, it was beautiful. Now y'all get this picture. About that time they treat. We rushed down into the swamps, and there the dogs were, treed up the biggest sweet gum tree in all of Amit River swamps. It was huge. You couldn't reach around this tree. There wasn't a limb on it for a while. Way up there, 
huge tree. And I looked around at John, and I said, John, I don't believe you can climb that tree. And it hurt John's feelings. He pushed his lips out, got fighting mad. He said, there ain't a tree in all these swamps that I can't climb. And he got his brogan shoes off, and he eased up to that sweet gum tree, and he hung his toenails in that bark, and he got his fingernails in there, and he kept easing up the tree, working his way toward that bottom limb, and he finally got to it, and he started on up into this big tree. Knock him out, John. It won't be long. And John worked his way on up to the top of the tree, and whoo, what a big one. And he reached around in his overhauls and got that sharp stick, and he drawed back and he punched the coon, but it wasn't a coon. It was a lynx. We call them souped up wildcats in Amen County. And that thing had great big tushes coming out of its mouth and red big claws on the end of its feet. And people, that thing attacked John up in the top of that tree. <laughs> wow! You can hear John squall. What's the matter with John? I don't have no idea. What in the world's happening to John? Knock him out, John. Wow! This thing's killing me. The whole top of the tree was shaking. The dogs got to biting the bark of the tree and fighting one another underneath the tree, and I was kicking them back. You dogs, get away. What's the matter with John? Knock him out, John. Woo! This thing's killing me. And John knew that Mr. Barron told it a pistol in his belt to shoot snakes with. And he kept hollering, Woo! Shoot this thing. Have mercy, this thing killing me. Shoot this thing. And Mr. Barron said, John, I can't shoot up in there. I might hit you. John said, well, just shoot up in here amongst us. One of us got to have some relief. Old Marcel, he's always tried to get in several kind of businesses to where he could make a profit and he wouldn't have to work so hard hauling pup wood. He went into the moving business one time. Got him a partner named James Lewis. Marcel led better moving company. Bought him some money and got him a few trucks and one day the phone rang, Mr. Ledbetter, will you move a piano for me? Yes, ma'am. They got to this house and it was a three-story house and a big bay window on the Second floor, they wanted to move the piano out of there and move it down to the ground. Marcel got up there and got to checking, and there wasn't no way. They'd done got the piano up there, and they'd fixed the door some way, and they couldn't wedge it down, and they didn't have enough folks to tote it, and Marcel said, I know what I'll do. He got him one of them big tube of sixes, went up there and nailed it on top of the house stuck it out over the house, put him a block and tackle up at one of them pulleys, brought the end down, brought it in the bay window and tied it around the piano. Real good. And James Lewis and the other hand went up there and was going to ease it out the window and Marcel and wrapped a rope around his wrist down there on the sidewalk. <laughs> All right now, y'all be careful. Shove it out easy and I'm going to ease it down. And they eased it out the window, and just as it left the ledge, that thing started down, and Marcel started up, had it around his arm. <laughs> he passed that piano about halfway up, and the piano hit the sidewalk. Bloom! Went into a thousand pieces. Splinters covered the whole street. Marcel's head hit that pulley up there. Boom! And down he come flat of his back. Boom! And just fell right backside, right down on all of that busted piano. Knocked him unconscious. Here comes James Lewis down the steps. Marcel, oh, Marcel. Oh, and he got out of him and he slapped him. Oh, speak to me. Marcel opened his eyes. He said, why should I speak to you? He said, I just, I just passed you twice up there and you didn't say nothing. One time they called a deacon's meeting at the East Fork Church. 
Uncle Versey Ledbetter was up in years and he didn't go to many of the deacon's meetings no more because he thought the youngsters, the young folks, them about 50 and 60, could take care of the church business. But he got word they was fixing to spend some money. And he got New Gene, his grandson, to take him over to the church house on a mule and wagon for the deacon's meeting. And they got in a big discussion about buying a chandelier. Man said, I move you, sir, that we buy a chandelier for the church. Another deacon said, I second a motion. The many discussion. And Uncle Versey Ledbetter said, sir, I'd like to speak. I want all of you to know that if we gonna buy a chandelier, there ain't nobody in our church got enough education that when we order it from Sears and Roebuck, if they could spell it. <laughs> then if we ordered the chandelier and it got here, there's nobody in our church that knows how to play it. <laughs> and what I'm concerned about is we don't need to spend this money on no chandelier as bad as we need lights in the church. <laughs> Not too long ago, I was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, doing one of them talk shows. Now, I had an encounter with the she coon of all of the women libbers in the world. <laughs> now, I'm not knocking women liberators. I've been one all my life. And I have all my life been willing for a lady to make wages like a man if she did a man's job. And I've always thought this, but I'm minding my own business. I'm sitting in the green room waiting to be called to come out on the big talk show before millions of people and the she coon come walking in the room. And I know she's a female as to how her dungarees are fitting her when she comes walking <laughs> in the room. I got up and said, lady, take my chair. She said, you sit down. I said, ma'am, you sit down. I said, lady, my ancestors would come up out of the grave and get me. I have been taught all my life to stand up and give a lady a chair. She said, you sit down. I said, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> So she sat down in the middle of the floor to embarrass me. Left me standing by the vacant chair. I said, lady, I wouldn't embarrass you for nothing in the world. I am a man what don't believe in embarrassing lady folks, and I want to do what's right. Tell me, what all women are you liberating? She said, every female in America, some phase of her life, I intend to help liberate. I said, well, let me tell you about me and mama. <laughs> Woo! I said, me and mama has been married 26 years. She was my childhood sweetheart. I ain't never had another date. And mama sleeps every morning till she gets ready to get up. <laughs> now, she might have to get up at 8 o'clock and unlock the door to let the lady in what I got hired to wait on mama. <laughs> oh! Yeah, and when mama does get up, she can fix her own breakfast or have it brought to her. It'll be mama's option, whichever way she wants it. And when mama does get up and watches them soap operas, she can watch it in three different rooms in the house. Laying down, leaning, or propped up. <laughs> whichever way she wants to do it. And when mama gets ready to go to the supermarket or get a hair fix, she goes in a brand new gold Lincoln Continental. I said, Ms. Woman Liver, mama don't want you messing with the deal she's got. <laughs> Well, I'm down at Route 4 Liberty, Mississippi. I visited everybody. 
and I'm getting ready to leave, Uncle Versus says, Jerry, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to talk to New Jean. New Jean, you remember, was the meanest young'un what ever lived <laughs> and the biggest liar I have ever known in my life. I remember there was a big collie dog in the community where I lived, and every year, the man that owned that collie dog would take a set of sheep sharers and share that dog. Big old, yeller, long-haired collie dog. And one summer, he shared that dog and just left a ring of hair around its neck and a great big bunch of hair on the end of its tail. <laughs> New Jean saw the dog and come running in the house, lion in the yard, oh, lion's gonna get us lying in the yard. <laughs> Uncle Versi looked out and saw it was that dog and said, New Jean, you go upstairs, I've told you about lying. I've done beat you and I done whooped you. And you go up there and you pray. And if you feel like the Lord has sufficiently let you know that you are forgiven, then I won't whoop you. But you go up there and pray 30 minutes about lying. A little while, New Jean come down the steps, said, do you have peace in your heart that you have been forgiven for lying about that dog? Yes, sir. Did the Lord make it real to you? Said, yes, sir, the Lord spoke to me. Said, the Lord told me first time he saw that dog, he thought it was a lion too. <laughs> now, you know, I ain't gonna lie to y'all. Uh, since I backed into show business, I have been making above average means. And I never did know how some of the more affluent folks lived. Well, not too long ago, I was invited to do a show for some rich folks at a world-famous resort hotel. Whoo, I got there a day early. Them yatchets was tied up in the harbor. Oh! <gasps> The bellman done met me in a tall hat and had on a claw hammer tail coat. <laughs> Got my bags and helped me up to my suite, up to my room. I walked in the room, there was some German imported chocolates on a silver tray for Mr. Clower's benefit. They hung up my clothes and put my suitcase up and man, I'm getting ready to get comfortable because Nebraska and Alabama are going to be playing football on television that afternoon. Oh, I got there a half a day early where I wouldn't miss it. And as I went to tip the bellman and handed him the money, I said, Sir, where is the television at in this room? Oh, sir, we don't have television at this world-famous resort hotel. I said, what? I said, man, they got television at them 8.88 a night. <laughs> said, oh, sir, but you don't understand. Our guests come here not to be disturbed by television. I said, well, I hope they got sense enough to turn it off if they don't want to watch it. I said, I'm going to see Nebraska and Alabama play. And you rich folks, I done fell out with y'all already. He said, well, the TV room is down close to the lobby. Now, folks, I had to dress, and what I was wanting to do is put on my loose-fitting pajamas. Oh, and fix it where my belly could flop around. <laughs> Rare back and fix it where that air conditioning unit could blow up this pajama leg and go down that one. <laughs> and watch Bad Bryant's boys whoop up on Nebraska. But I had to dress and go down in the lobby to watch your dad playing football game. <laughs> and while I'm down there watching it, it's in the third quarter and it's tied up. In walk four high society women, got them little fancy frizzled britches on. Had on a cute little cap. Each one of them had a tennis racket. And they come walking in and said, oh, sir, we're going to switch the television. 
I said, ma'am. said, oh, yes, the Slim Jim tournament is on the other station. Now, some kind of Slim was in that. I, I remember that distinctly. Whoo, so I think it was somebody named Virginia what was in the Slim tournament. Well, as I remember, she said. Oh. And I said, ladies, I love everybody. But y'all are fixing to read in the morning paper big headlines all the way across the page. Grand old Opry star and born again Southern Baptist whoops four women at the Rich Hotel. You know, money was real short when me and Marcel Ledbetter was growing up, and we was wanting to get us enough of money to go see a Tarzan picture show. We caught a bunch of raccoons and sent to hide off to Sears and Roebuck, but the price dropped, and when we got our check, it was for a dime. That's all they brought. So we decided we'd take to the woods with our possum dogs and just sell possums for folks to eat. And we were in the Johnson Station community one night, out up north of the railroad where they had a lot of persimmon trees, and we was possum hunting. And about that time, <laughs> we were possum hunting, and about that time, I heard the big freight train coming. And Marcel broke and run with his lantern, put his red bandana around that light where it'd make it bright red, and he stood straddle of the railroad track and went to waving that lantern, flagging the train. Flag, uh, Marcel, he were, he flagging that train. Whoa, he'd, he'd wave it. Man, a hundred car banana train squeaked to a halt. <laughs> the engineer and the fireman jumped off. Said, what kind of emergency do we have here? Marcel said, I wanted to see if y'all wanted to buy a possum. Man said, you idiot, you mean to tell me that you have done stopped a hundred car banana train seeing if we wanted to buy a possum? You must be an idiot. But I like possum, and inasmuch as we have stopped, what do you want for him? Marcel said, we ain't caught him yet. I just want to see if you wanted one. <laughs> You know, when I was a young'un growing up, the main most sport was marbles. <laughs> Whatever happened to playing marbles? We'd draw a great big circle in the dirt and put the marbles in the center of the circle and we'd get out on one knee and we'd come to tall. And we'd shoot that good Aggie, the tall we called it, at the marbles. And how many of them you knocked out was yours? And you could keep them if your mama didn't find it out. <laughs> and I remember one time my brother Sonny, he played hooky from school. Helped him build a highway one year. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd help him work on them old bulldozers. And one day they was working on that bulldozer and they done found some of them steel Aggie ball barons, and we never had seen none of them. And man, he decided he'd come to school with five of them. Oh, and he gave me three of them. And when they piled all them marbles in the end of that circle, and I got out there with that steel Aggie, boom, man, I done busted up the game. <laughs> and we had a fella named Ben D. Lauder. He is meaner in school than Marcel Ledbetter was. He was forever more vicious, Ben D. Lauder. I was scared of him as I was a bear. Ben said, I want you to give me one of them steel marbles. I said, I can't do it, Ben. He commenced a whooping on me and the bell rung and we run in the schoolhouse. And he's sitting in that little desk. He'd been in the eighth grade eight times. <laughs> and he'd whisper, I'm gonna beat you to death if you don't give me one of them big steel marbles. 
I didn't know how in the world I was going to get away from Ben. But what I did was ease out of my desk and went back to the back of the room in the study hall like I was cold. And I took two of them big Aggies, them steel marbles, and put them up on top of the stove. And I got them forever more red, scalding hot. And I had me one of them brand new pair, of them red rider gloves I had got for Christmas. Had that fringe on the side right there. Oh, had Red Rider's picture up on the top of it right there. Yeah, Santa Claus had done brought them to me. Uh, and when them steel Aggies got hot, I mean forever more hot, I went back there with my Red Rider gloves on, and I picked them up right quick and went and put them down on that little trench up at the top of my desk where your pencil went, right there by that hole where your ink bottle is supposed to go but we never did have no ink. <laughs> and then when I laid them two hot Aggies up there, I went to the pencil sharpener like I was gonna sharpen my pencil. <laughs> Miss Mentally Stone, the teacher, she had us studying. She just sitting up at her desk. Big Ben seen them Aggies on my desk. <laughs> he come easing up there. You know, like he wasn't up to nothing where the teacher wouldn't get on him. And he had a right brand new pair of overhauls on and he just kind of squatted down. And that back pocket is open right there and he took his pencil and just raked him in his back pocket. <laughs> just like nothing happened, he's back to the desk and sit down right quick. <laughs> oh! And he started jumping up and down in that desk and he hung in it, he's overgrown anyhow. And Miss Minnelly Stone, the teacher, run up there with this big paddle and commenced to beating him. Hush, Ben, what you screaming about? Said, boy, you got ants in your pants. Said, no, ma'am, hot steel balls. <laughs> I remembered to ask Marcel, Uncle Versus' oldest boy, did he have any repercussions from the problem he had had on a beer joint what was located on the county line just about a week before that. What Marcel had done, Marcel didn't like his school, none. He didn't like them teachers, he didn't like them books. <coughs> but Uncle Versi made him stay in school till he was old enough to get his driver's license and bought him a second-hand pupwood truck. <laughs> and he quit school and went to hauling pupwood. Now, Marcel had loaded up his pupwood truck and had took a load out to Macomb and unloaded it out there on the big box car what was going to the paper company. And he is driving back in the hot of the evening. It's just full sundown. That sun is staring him right in the face back out to East Fork community where he lived. Well, now, Amit County is dry. The people are dry. And they had never voted in no kind of alcoholic beverage. A cool one, you have to ride over on the county line where they got a joint. Marcel was coming along there, and he'd had fine Christian teachings. He knowed better than to buy any of them cool beers. But he knew also that they had them big knee-high belly washers, and he wanted one of them so bad. He eased his old pupwood truck over off the paved highway. Now, all he had on him between him and the Lord was just a pair of overhauls, that's all. He was barefooted and just his overhauls on, that's all. He did have the bottom button on the sides button. The top buttons were. The top buttons was flopping. And he got eased off it and he put it down in neutral and he pulled the emergency brake up on his truck and he eased up to this tavern and he looked through the screen door and said hey man behind the counter and asked said, what you want he said would you hand me a cold soda water you better get away from that door go get you a shirt on get you on some clothes we don't want the likes of you in here i ain't coming in all i want you to do is hand me a cold soda water through the door and i'll pay you for it and pay you for the old bottle and i'll drink it while i'm driving home there's four fellas sitting around a table there playing this year boo-ray card game. 
And one of them said, didn't you hear him tell you to get away from that door, you redneck? Poor Marcel, walking on them gravels out there, went back to his truck and reached over in the toolbox and brought out one of them lightweight McCullough chainsaws. <laughs> And he reached down and he took a hold of that starting rope. And he walked up to the door of that beer joint and he just stuck the snout of that thing through the screen door. And he reamed him out a hole in that screen door and he eased it over to the side and it hung in that, in that, in that screen door. That's and he held it out up over his head and ribbed it up where all them screen wires and hinges and thing had come loose from it. Whop! And then he stepped inside, <laughs> raced the motor three or four times and slung that thing at a table and just took off two legs and the table said, Whop! They gave Marcel the beer joint. <laughs> this farmer was sitting out in the backyard discussing with his manager about they had to buy a new bull. And it was just imperative that they had to bring some more bloodlines onto the farm. There was three bulls already on the place and they were out in the lot and they could hear this guy talking. <laughs> and the first bull said, look at here, I've been here three years. There ain't but 50 cows here. 30 of them cows belong to me. Now, I don't care what kind of Mr. Big Shot Bull he brings him. I ain't about to be nice to him. Second Bull said, I ain't been here but a year and a half. But I agree with you, I ain't about to put up with it. We'll make life miserable for him. And I'll guarantee you, I ain't about to share nothing with him. Third Bull said, I ain't been here but six months. And I don't have but about five cows that even like me. <laughs> But I'll tell you right now, I ain't giving up them five. <laughs> Mr. Bull's gonna be in a bad state of affairs. Next day, here come one of them big, long trucks. Wow, great big diesels out on each side of it. Oh, smoke belching from it. Drove up in the yard, let down the end gate. Choo -choo. Brakes cut off, that eye come off of them. Whoo, there's about a biggest, raunchiest looking old Bramer bull ever been, walked off of that thing, weighed way over a ton, cause <laughs> snorting. Didn't have to look through the fence to see the cows grazing down in the pasture. He's flat footed, just looked over the fence out. Great big hump on his back. And man, he just went strutting around the lot, you know. Man, he was something. First bull said, you know, I've been doing a little thinking. It's real ugly for me to have the attitude I've been having. And I just think I'll share it with him. And the second bull said, you know, I, I've changed my mind too. I, I really uh, want to do the right thing about it. And the third bull busted out of the stall, run out in the lot and commenced to paw in the ground. And just bristles up on his back and him trotting around out there. Pawing the dirt. Urgh, Bella. The bull said, hey, man, what in the world are you doing? You crazy? That thing will kill you. He said, look, I just want to make for sure that he knows that I'm a bull. <laughs> This story I am about to tell you, the inspiration comes to me from the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Georgia, Mr. Zell Miller. That's right. I grew up at Route 4, Liberty, Mississippi. The county seat town was a small town. Volunteer fire department. It was in the middle of the summer. Big drought, no water. Everybody knew if a building caught on fire, it was gone. Cause there wasn't no water, they just couldn't draw it up fast enough to put out no fire. 
One Saturday evening, a building caught on fire. Commenced to burning. The crowd gathered with their arms folded, squalling, watching the building burn because there ain't no water. About that time, here come Uncle Versi Ledbetter and Aunt Pet in an old truck. Had all of the young'uns with them. Ardell, Burnell, Raynell, W.L., Linnell, Odell, Udell, Marcel, Claude, New Jean, and Clovis is all hanging on that old truck. Everybody heard them coming, the fenders rattling. Blah, 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 blah. Here they come. And the crowd parted because it's coming pretty fast. And they run right on up on the sidewalk and right up in the middle of the fire. Into the fire, and it jumped off and took off the overhaul jumpers and went to flopping and stomping the fire. Wow, putting it out. Ain't Pet Let Better had her bonnet telling them, ho, stomp over him, get it out. Wow, wow. And they stomped the fire out. They put it slap out. The folks cheered. Oh! The Ledbetters, they're heroes. They put out to the fire. They passed a hat, took up a collection, took up $31. Give the money to Uncle Versi. Said, sir, we love you. You are a hero. Said, tell us what you gonna buy with the $31. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is get the brakes fixed on that truck. Well, I done met more folks out there in Hollywood. I was out there the other day, and one of them MCA record executives said, Jerry, I sure would love to go bird hunting. I said, what kind of birds? He said, quail. Quail hunting in the whole world is in South. Set up the date I met this big record executive in Jackson, Mississippi. He landed in the big jet, got off, had his hunt for me, Roy. <laughs> In the car and got on Interstate 55, went on down the route. Beautiful Versi Ledbetter Farm. I drove just a minute, sir. Let me tell Uncle Versi we're gonna be hunting. And in Uncle Versi's so glad to welcome, son. I said, thank you, Uncle Versi. I started out of the door and Uncle Versi said, for me, son. He said, old Della, my mew is with her. Veterinarian and she's suffering. And I just couldn't stand to see him put her to sleep yesterday. Jerry, would you shoot her for me? I said, yeah, Uncle Versi, I don't like to do it, but if she's suffering, I'll shoot her for you. He said, you just go ahead and shoot her and go on bird hunting and me and the boys will... On the way back to the car, I said, I'm gonna have me some fun out of this Hollywood dude. <laughs> I got old scoundrel told me I couldn't... Good as I've been to him, he's told that Hollywood city slicker away. I beat the dashboard with my fist and I walked all down the road about a hundred yards, slammed on brakes. I said, uh -huh. I grabbed my shotgun, I jumped out, boom, boom, and down old Della went, graveyard dead. <laughs> and just as I, just as I turned around and looked over to see what the dude thought, I heard three shots over there, boom, boom, boom. I said, fella, what are you doing? He said, Jerry, I killed three of his cows. <laughs> mm. When I was growing up, coon hunter in the world, Macomb, Mississippi. And we done sent him word by the hog in the world, good as highball. Don't you ever say or we don't believe it none. Well, we got us up a little contest. They said, yeah, this fella will catch more coon well. Well, East Fork School, that's where we met. And I was a cage and sitting up in the... <laughs> Marcel said, whoo, look, don't let that thing out. Said he looks... Ah, oh, said, keep him in there. Said he looks too much like folks to be getting out of that. <laughs> you leave him up in that pickup truck. The fella said, y'all don't understand. I use a dog with the monkey. I just want one good tree dog, and I'll show you how to catch more raccoons. The hides are expensive, and I make a good living with that monkey, coon hunting. Ma says, and I ain't taking my dog with that trashy thing. <laughs> Clovis said, I'll take old June, and we'll go. So all of us followed, and old June hadn't gone very far, and she treed. Now, any coon hunter will know that sometimes a raccoon will get up in a tree and he'll tap the tree, go out on a limb and jump into another tree. 
go out on a limb and jump into another one and come down way out, John. Well, that's the art of being a good coon dog. You circle around, make for sure he ain't tapped the tree, and he's up there if you say he's there. Well, old June Tree, to turn that monkey loose, had him on a chain, and people, he had a flashlight in his left hand and a pistol in his right hand. <laughs> and up that tree he went, boogity, 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 right up that tree, went all over the tree, shining that light and had that gun. Looking everywhere. Out on each limb, shining, shining, shining. And what he did, he find the coon and shoot him, and the coon falls out. Well, he hadn't found no coon. Down the tree he come. Thumb cocked that pistol, put it up to old June's head, Clovis his dog, and said, Bloom! Just killed him. <laughs> Graveyard dead, right there. Clovis said, Man, what in the world do you mean? That trashy thing has killed my dog. <laughs> and the fellow what owned the monkey said, Clovis, there ain't but one thing that monkey hates worse than a raccoon, and that's a lying coon dog. <laughs> I went to see Marcel Ledbetter the other day. His brother, Claude, was the only one in the community catching any fish. Folks was going and they wasn't catching nothing. Old Claude Ledbetter, he'd come in with a pickup truck loaded down. So the State Game and Fish Commission of Mississippi decided they'd go fishing with Claude, just see how he was catching them. Claude had told them, popped off, said, y'all don't know how to do it. Said, y'all ought to just go with me and watch me. Well, a game warden got up in the boat with him, and they took off out in the middle of the river. And the game warden said, all right, Claude, I'm going to see how you catching all these fish when can't nobody else catch none. Claude raised the lid on the boat seat and got a big, long stick of dynamite. <laughs> Lit the fuse on it. Let it go down to kind of short and draw it back and chunked it. Blum! And them big catfish come turning their belly up, <laughs> whooping it out of that water, and Claude is just getting them by the tub full. Game warden said, boy, that's against the law. You can't do that. Don't you know you breaking the law? Well, Claude's done lit another big stick of dynamite. <laughs> Handed it to the game warden. It going, shh. Game warden took that stick of dynamite and said, you idiot, this is against the law. You can't do that. Stand, argue, or fish. <laughs> The Independent Oil Association of America had their meeting at a big hotel down at Houston, Texas. And they got this PhD fella from way up in the Midwest to come and make a speech. Now, folks, he forevermore made a speech. It so inflamed and enthused all of those oil folks that they called the executive committee together and they said, listen, let's hire that fella and let's put him out on the road making this same speech just to wherever he can gather up a crowd, let him talk to him. And he did. Bought him a big car and got him a chauffeur with a blue serge suit. And this man just started traveling all over the country making this speech. Well, after they had been doing this for about eight months, going down the four-lane highway, that chauffeur looked in the rearview mirror and he said, Professor, what? He said, there ain't no fairness in this country. My good man, why would you make a statement like that? He said, I can make that cotton-picking speech as good as you can. And I'm barely making a living on what y'all paying me, and you're getting rich. He said, sir, I want you to know that I got my BS degree. He said, don't start all wherever you got all them things. I ain't interested in them. I done heard you make that speech once a day for eight months. I done memorized it. I'm a better speech maker than you are, and I can make the cotton-picking speech better than you can. It's just that simple. He said, I'm fixing to go to a major university and they ain't never seen me. They don't even know what I look like. You pull over to the roadside park up here, we are about the same size. 
and we'll trade clothes, and I'll break you from sucking eggs. We'll put you up there on the stage and let you make the speech, and I'll be the chauffeur and sit out in the congregation, and I'll watch you make a fool out of yourself. That suits me fine. Let's change clothes. Now, y'all get this picture. They drive up to the big major university, the real professor with the blue serge suit on driving the big car. The chauffeur sitting on the back seat with a little briefcase in his lap. 22,000 people in the field house. Standing room only, the great PhD, what graduated from the great school of minds, was coming to speak. And they introduced him, and just as he got up to speak, there was the real professor sitting on the back row with the hard bell chauffeur's cap in his lap, peeping at him. Now y'all talking about making a speech. Whoo, he forevermore shell down the corn. He shucked it right on down to the car. They throwed their books in the air, wallered on the floor, hollered, give him a standing ovation, screamed, and they finally got order restored. And the president of the school got up and said, well, we have about 10 minutes before the bell rings. I wonder if y'all would like to ask this gentleman any questions. <laughs> Yes, would you like to ask him any questions? Well, y'all have seen the type. A fella got up in the, about halfway back with big horn rim glasses on, a real egg head, had books under each arm. He said, Professor, if one of those dinosaurs died, what roamed the earth two billion years ago, and his carcass rotted, and the Earth's atmosphere built up layer after layer after layer to 5,986 feet. And two billion years later, a drill bit drilling a well on a wildcat venture bores through this decayed carcass. What will the pH of the soil be that's contained in the core of the drill bit? And what will be the name of the stratosphere? This fellow just stood there and looked at him. You could have heard a pin drop. And this fellow said, Mr. Student, as long as I've been in this business, that's about the most simplest question I've ever been asked since I've been speaking. I'm surprised Dad let a man that don't know no more than you know get in this university. And just to show you how simple the question is, my chauffeur's in the back of the room. I'll ask him to stand up now. <laughs> Where I come from, we still set up with the dead. When I was a boy, there was no exceptions to this, none whatsoever. Nowadays, we done got kind of fancy. The funeral home director may get up at 10 o'clock in the evening and say the funeral home is closed and we'll open back up in the morning at 7 o'clock. Well, we was having a funeral in southwest Mississippi the other day. And that funeral director got up and made that announcement, and Uncle Versi Ledbetter said, Sir, you go right ahead and close your funeral home. But my friend and neighbor, Brother Zeiss, is dead. And I want you to know that we ain't gonna leave him here by himself. So now you shut the front door and go on home, but I'm gonna make two of my boys stay here with him all night. Clovis and New Jean Ledbetter, they're gonna be here with him. Now, they won't get in your way. They'll just be sitting here by my dead friend all night. Everybody left in about 30 minutes. Clovis could see a neon light on a beer joint over yonder across the road. And Clovis said, New Gene, I believe I'll step over yonder and get us something to drink. New Gene said, uh-uh, I ain't staying here with him by myself. And Eugene said, Clovis, I'll run over and get us something. Clovis said, uh-uh, I ain't about to stay here with him by myself either. And said, I understand there's four more down the hall. <laughs> they sat there about another hour, and they could see that neon light on over there, and they got to smacking their lips, and their mouth got dry as cotton. 
And directly they decided they'd go to the beer joint and get them something to drink and just take a dead man with them. <laughs> so they got him up and one got on one side and one on the other. And they stood him up between them and they started walking to the beer joint. Every now and then, they'd let the dead feller's foot drag in the middle of the road where people would think he was stepping right along with them. <laughs> they went on in the beer joint and stood him up at the counter. Put one of them four-legged stools right behind him and wedged him in there, and there he was. <laughs> Clovis was over here drinking, and Eugene is over him. The dead man was the best-dressed man in the whole beer joint. <laughs> About that time, a fight broke out. Mm -hmm. Fist fight. Busting chairs over one another's head. And somebody took a fist and hit Uncle Zias right side the head and cut him a flip right out in the middle of the floor. Here come the police lining them up, handcuffing them, searching them. Clovis saw Uncle Zias in the middle of the floor and he fell down there by him and put his arm under his head and commenced to screaming and crying. <laughs> and he pointed at the fellow and said, you killed him, you killed him. I saw you when you hit him, you killed him, you killed him. And the sheriff run over out of handcuffs the fellow that hit him. And the fellow said, Sheriff, wait a minute. I did hit the fellow. But it was self-defense. He pulled a pocket knife on me. Thank you. God bless you. I love you.